Hi everybody, I'm Greg Fischel and welcome to bonus weather video number one for this week and had a request to talk about supercell thunderstorms and so I thought we'd talk about some of the basics associated with that. Well, a normal thunderstorm where you don't have a lot of vertical wind shear, in other words, the winds are fairly light throughout the entire atmosphere, uh, the air becomes uh, very warm and moist near the ground and then it becomes buoyant. In other words, it's uh, uh, less dense than the air around it and so buoyancy is a force and any force causes the air to not only move but to accelerate. And so you get an updraft that accelerates up through the atmosphere and then eventually what happens is that there's enough cooling that goes on with that that you produce clouds and rain and eventually the raindrops become big enough that so they start falling back down through the updraft and they basically kill it. And so a normal thunderstorm in that kind of an environment has a life cycle that's fairly short. In other words, the updraft forms the thunderstorm, you get the thunder and the lightning and the heavy rain, and once that heavy rain starts to fall all the way back to the ground, that's an indication that the downdraft has become uh, stronger than the updraft and the storm pretty much falls apart at that point. All that can happen within about an hour's time. But when you have vertical wind shear, in other words, the winds are stronger as you go up through the atmosphere, then that tends to tilt the storm. And so the updraft is tilted like this, the rain falls, and instead of falling back through the updraft, it falls separate from the updraft. And so the two remain two distinct entities, and it allows the storm to survive a much, much longer period of time. So the stronger the vertical wind shear is, the longer the life cycle that the storm uh, is likely to have. Now, the other thing that comes into play here is the vertical wind shear creating what we call vorticity. And remember, vorticity is just a fancy scientific word for spin in the atmosphere. So if you have uh, winds that are light near the ground and then they increase as you go up, think of a, about a cylinder here. It's going to start to rotate, but the axis of rotation is going to be horizontal. Okay, It's not going to be in the vertical. It's going to be in the horizontal to start with. But what happens after that is that a thunderstorm forms, it has an updraft, and it tilts that horizontal axis of spinning or vorticity into the vertical. Okay, So the updraft actually tilts that vorticity axis so that now the air is rotating counterclockwise around a vertical axis as opposed to along a horizontal axis. Okay, Think about a football as it spirals as you throw it. I can't throw it well enough to do that, but people that can throw it well enough to do that, you can sort of use that as an analogy. And so you get a rotating updraft and because the air accelerates up through that updraft due to the force of buoyancy, the pressure has to drop in the mid-levels of the atmosphere to support that wind speed, okay? In other words, there always have to, has to be a certain pressure gradient or pressure difference over a given location to support a given wind speed. So as the updraft, uh, or the, uh, updraft strengthens as you go up through the atmosphere and it accelerates, then the pressure has to drop in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, and that creates an even stronger updraft because you have a difference in pressure at the ground to an even lower pressure in the middle levels of the atmosphere. So all this stuff sort of feeds off each other and makes the thunderstorm even stronger. And then with the rotating updraft, if things are just perfect, you can end up getting rotation over an even smaller scale. And that's when you get a tornado. Now, you all remember April 16th of 2011 when we had multiple tornadoes, including one uh, that leveled uh, parts of Sanford and then uh, headed up toward Wake County in a somewhat weakened state, but it was still very strong. Well, this is the reflectivity image. And when I say reflectivity, the radar beam goes out, it bumps into a raindrop, gets all excited, and comes back to the radar. And because you know how fast the radar beam is traveling and how long it took to go out there, hit that object, and come back, you can then calculate how far away that object is. So if you look at this image here, and here's Sanford, okay? So the hook was right in here. And so the tornado was located right in this area at that particular point in time. Now, why is there this relatively clear area in here? This is where the updraft is. And the updraft is so strong, it's suspending the raindrops aloft, okay? And so the radar beam doesn't see anything because all the raindrops are above it. Now, if you tilt the radar beam up enough, then you start to run into the raindrops that that updraft is suspending, and then you can see that more clearly. The other thing is, notice this little white in here. 
that can either be rain or hail or it can be debris okay around the tornado itself and there's actually a new variable uh, that we've used in recent years called the correlation coefficient where it takes a look at the uniformity of the size of the particles that the radar is detecting and if those sizes are all very different that implies that it isn't looking at raindrops or it isn't necessarily looking at hailstones but it's looking at debris objects that have various different shapes and sizes and so that particular variable makes it easier to detect uh, that debris and that can be uh, pretty much confirmation that there's a tornado on the ground whereas before we had to wait for somebody that was in that location to actually say yep I see it and it's you know <laughs> spraying stuff all over the place and it, it's a tornado so the radar imagery in that sense is very very helpful and then if you take a look at the velocity image now the radar in this particular case is up in here and so it's looking down at the cell like this and these red colors indicate uh, raindrops or whatever it's detecting moving away from the radar. In fact, let me see if I can't uh, make a little arrow here and uh, show that a little bit more clearly. So the radar is up here, and uh, I don't know why that's not... To, oh, you know what? It's probably because the color. Let's see if I can change the color here a little bit and make an arrow. Come on, Greg, figure this out. Well, I guess it's not going to do it for me. I don't know why. Um, but uh, I was going to say that in this area here, I'll just do it with my cursor. Uh, you can see that the reds are going away from the radar. So these raindrops or objects are going like this. And then the blues are coming toward the radar. And so think of it as a merry-go-round. You're up here watching the merry-go-round from the side. Uh, these kids on the horses are going away from you. These kids on the horses are going toward you. And the center of rotation is right in there. So that's how the radar detects uh, the presence of a tornado by seeing objects moving in different directions at high speeds adjacent to each other like that. Okay, well, despite the fact that my little uh, telestration exercise didn't work, I hope that made sense. Uh, that completes bonus weather video for today. We'll have another one for you upcoming on Friday and, of course, our regular daily weather update coming up for you tomorrow afternoon. We'll see you then. You all take care.